I would like to start this presentation with a question. Is morselation safe? Is minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery with morselation safe for fibroids? And may be asking, what is morselation? You may be asking, why are we talking about this? So I'm going to start with the first slide that I have. There are 500,000 hysterectomies in the United States every year. And that's quite a lot. 40% are due to symptomatic fibroids. So fibroids are supposedly benign tumors, and they do cause symptoms like heavy bleeding during your period, pelvic pain, and fibroids are common. 60 to 80% of women will de develop a fibroid. They're more common in the African-American community. Usually, it uh, forms at ages of 30 to 50 years old. So back in 2014, at that time, somewhere around 50 to 100,000 women were having morselation for symptomatic fibroids. So what was happening is that these women, some of them were fine. Most of them were fine, but one in 350, which would equate to maybe 150 to 300 women per year, after they had their surgery, they were told they had an unsuspected sarcoma. And sarcoma is a very aggressive cancer. But because these women had morselation, and most of these women that do have these are a stage one. So that's what we're going to be speaking from. But if they did not have the morselation and the uterus was taken out whole, there would be a 60 to 80% five-year survival with sarcoma, specifically leiomyosarcoma, which is a cancer that I have. Because I had morselation, like actually I did, I'm a patient who had morselation, Essentially, it changed me from a stage one to a stage four. And that's uh, very significant because the five-year survival for stage four is 10 to 15 percent. And during the 2014, when I first, first started writing about morselation, within the five-year period, morselation was increasing in practice. And so it increased within the last five years of that time, 25%, which is huge. Why would it increase? Well, this is a morselator and a picture of a morselator. And essentially how the morselator works is during a minimally invasive surgery, there are usually about three cuts underneath the belly button. This is the morselator here. The morselator will be entered through one of the incisions, and it will have a camera as well so that you can see what's inside the belly. So this morselator is an electrical tool, and at the very tip, it has a thinning blade that essentially grinds the uterus. Now, the uterus wouldn't fit through the small incisions unless it was put into bits and pieces. And so these bits and pieces are then suctioned after it is grind out through the top of the morselator. So the grasper is above the morselator, and usually the graspers are used to hold the uterus as the morselator continues to do its work. As it's spinning, there is a lot of splattering going on. It's, you, can, you can imagine uh, an analogy to the morselator would be a blender. You have a blade on the bottom, you can imagine if you put an apple in the blender, uh, not only would it crush it into a bunch of little pieces, but it's going to spray it all over the glass. So th that's exactly what happens in the body of the woman. As the morselator is working, the spray is hitting all throughout the belly of the woman, the, the abdominal cavity. And little bits and pieces and microscopic cells are seeding on the peritoneum, which is the abdominal cavity. So th this is why the morselator 
was a problem, why the FDA in, on July 11, 2014 warned that it can spread undetected cancer. One of the questions you may have had, well, if I if don't use a morselator, what are my options? So the vaginal hysterectomy is a procedure that is recommended by the OBGYN Society, ACOG, but it's very interesting that only 10% of the GYNs are trained. So when you have 600,000 hysterectomies, it would be very hard to have them all done vaginally. They can only be done vaginally if they are a certain size and mobility because what happens is the uterus is taken out whole through the vaginal cavity. The other option is an open laparotomy hysterectomy, which is the gold standard, and that's like a C-section, but of course it would be much smaller if the fibroid is not so big. And that is a procedure that is another option. The uh, last option is the one we've been speaking about, minimally invasive laparoscopic morselation. And as I mentioned, about 1 in 350 women who are having this surgery will be at risk for the spread of unsuspected aggressive cancer. And why is that a problem? Because it's going to result in premature death. So GYNs liked using the morselator. The medical admins enjoyed using the morselator. And the reason is, is that the patient doesn't have to be hospitalized as long, so they don't need to be round on and looked after, and also it's more efficient in the operating room. But what kind of problems are there with morselation? Well, number one, you can miss a cancer diagnosis. And the reason you could do that is because you can imagine you're getting this spaghetti, basically, uh, morselated uterine tissue, and it's going to be impossible to check the areas or know what areas were in a particular plane. They will just be randomly taking samples and looking at them. It's much more likely that you will miss a diagnosis of cancer. So, and number two, the other problem is upstaging your cancer and early death. So as we mentioned, the tumor tissue as well as the normal tissue of the uterus and a bunch of cells and slurry material are going to be spread all over by the blades of the power morselation. So the morselator has a defective design. It violates a couple of rules. And number one is the golden rule of surgery, which is to treat every tumor as if it was malignant. So what does that mean? That means keeping the tumor intact and as undisturbed as possible while you remove it with benign normal cell margins. In other words, you're getting all of the tumor out. And that is what a lot of oncologists do. And because 1 in 350 women are at risk for sarcoma, the GYNs need to treat each uterus in that same way. And the second violation is the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm. The women affected are usually stage one, so there is a possible cure if everything is taken intact out of the body. And many of these women are professional women, working, they have families, they have kids. This accelerates the cancer in a way that it destroys many families. And for many families, it has created orphan children. And if you can imagine just being one of these women going to surgery and being told you're one in 350 women, and sorry, it's just bad luck. This is what GYNs often will tell you. So it's interesting that in 2006, there was knowledge that the uterine tissue was spreading and causing uh, essentially a stage four deadly cancer. And it was a pathologist, his name was Dr. Robert Lamparter, who was getting all these samples of spaghetti type uterine tissue. And he was finding that at a rate of one in 400, there was unanticipated aggressive sarcoma. 
So he reached out to the Johnson & Johnson Ethicon safety control officer, letting them know that this is happening and something needs to be done. Nothing was done. During that time, there were also articles as well about the spread of cancer with a morselator. So Dr. Lamparter did not feel comfortable bringing it to the public, but in early 2014, he did make a statement. And shortly after his statement and after the FDA hearing on morselation, Johnson & Johnson withdrew their morselators from surgical shelves. So you might ask, can't you do testing for this cancer? Well, currently, there's no available test, none that will distinguish a benign fibroid from a malignant cancer. And this is very important because if you can't distinguish whether or not it's malignant, you need to treat the uterus during a hysterectomy as a malignant tumor. So minimally invasive surgery for that one in 350 women could be maximally invasive. So you need to be aware. GYNs have been using this. They've been increasing their use before the FDA hearing. They are actually now, there's a lot of ads and a lot of uh, marketing to the GYN community to get minimally invasive surgery back. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But what's important is that you need to advocate for yourself and you have to ask questions. You don't want to place blind trust in your GYN surgeon. So your GYN is going to try and reassure you because it's not a common thing to have sarcoma. He's going to tell you or she's going to tell you it's the best option. But you need to know that it's not because you're playing Russian roulette. You don't know if you're going to be that one. And so there are some GYMs that are still pandering to women aesthetics because they're saying, you know, you're going to still be able to wear your bikini and you'll look fine. You'll also be able to go to work earlier. So as an advocate, when you're speaking to a, your doctor, your surgeon about surgery, you need to ask more questions because sometimes they will also exaggerate minor complications of an open surgery. So they will tell you there's an increase of infection, bleeding, you'll stay in the hospital longer, you'll need to recover much longer. But really, these are small things that do not really impede you that much. They assure you that you will not be the one in 350 with a deadly sarcoma. So for infection, you can be given antibiotics during or after surgery. For bleeding, it's really only 40 cc's, which I believe is about four teaspoons of blood. That's not much. And the longer stay in the hospital is two to three days, which is going to cost that medical institution more money. And the recovery is seven to 10 days. So medical institutions are going to try to get you to do minimally invasive surgery because it's much more efficient and their revenue is much higher with more salation. Now I want you to note that with that same GYN, let's assume they are also an OB, was asked a question about elective C-section deliveries. It's very likely that the GYN will offer a C-section for your delivery. But you know, that has the same risks or maybe bigger risks because the incision is going to be much bigger. 2014 was the FDA hearing for the Morselator. There is a panel. Some of the original panel members actually were found by Dr. Human Norchasm to be associated with some medical device companies and had been given money. I think the largest amount was about 100000 So we were able to tell the chair the chairman about this problem, and they were removed and replaced. So we were a grass 
roots a bunch of people. The women were patients that have sarcoma, and the men were the spouses whose wife died. They were all trying to help to stop morselation so that no other woman would need to undergo these risks. I want to mention that there was a, a large discussion, and at the end of the discussion, the chairman asked Dr. Shriver, who is an oncologist, he asked him his opinion about, about whether or not the morselator should uh, still be used. And Dr. Shriver said within his conscience, he could not endorse the morselator for any type of surgery. And he mentioned how it violated the golden rule principle to treat all tumors as if malignant, and also mentioned that by having a morselated surgery, you violate the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm. So even after Dr. Shriver's little answer, the panel convened and they came back with a warning. We wanted a band on the Morse later, we as the grassroots survivors, but instead we got a warning and a black box on the Morse later. After the FDA hearing and after Dr. Lamparter, the pathologist, made his public statement, Johnson & Johnson withdrew all the morselators from the surgical shelves. And of course, this was probably because of the fear of litigation. Several medical institutions decided they would not use the power morselator for surgeries, but many more than not were still using the morselator under an informed consent that would say that there's a rare risk of spreading cancer. Many of the GYNs were unhappy with the FDA statement, and they tried in many different ways to collect data, and of course they wanted to have the Morse later, that was their goal, so they could change the data so that the research would possibly overturn the FDA's decision. So they tried to mention that the large review the FDA made was incorrect. I think during the FDA meeting, one woman surgeon tried to convince the panel with her research that she accumulated that really sarcoma is only one in 7,000. And there were a lot of issues with the way she collected the data. And the data also was quite old. So a lot of these GYNs, especially in the minimally invasive clinics, they're really still rooting to keep minimally invasive morselation going. So a few months after the FDA hearing in December, the American Journal of OBGYN published a long-term retrospective review revealing that uh, risk of sarcoma is actually higher than what the FDA said. So out of over 3,500 women, they found the risk to be 1 in 156 who underwent surgery with morselation. Moreover, in this particular article, they found an even higher percentage of women who would have parasitic benign fibroids. So basically what happened was that the fibroid pieces attached as they were spread and spewed out, and they began to grow, and they caused obstruction, and they required further surgery. So this was a good article for us, and this came out of the Journal of OBGYN. Michigan also had voluntary database for their surgeries, and Oh, I want to mention that to the other 3,500 uh, women, they were followed long-term, where here in Michigan, this was more of a short-term study, but it revealed 2.7% or 1 out of 37, an unexpected GYN cancer diagnosis. And 1 out of 98, 
a risk of endometrial cancer being spread. So I just want to give you a little bit of the morselation history. There is a an amendment that was made. It was the 510K legislation that was put in place in 1976. And what it did was it allowed the predicate device. If there was a predicate device, then if it was similar, they would fast track the, the clearance of that device. So they wouldn't have any clinical trials. Since this 510K has been implemented, about 98% of all devices have gone through clearance. In 1997, we'll take an example. Johnson & Johnson, the Ethicon morselator, passed the clearance as being substantially equivalent. What they thought they would do is to try to get it cleared by saying, oh, it's very similar to the Cook's power morselator, which was used in urology at that time for a very short time. And then they got rid of Morse later. And since 1993, if you looked within the 10 years, the FDA cleared 10 different Morse laters, so different manufacturers. So it's interesting to note that the FDA actually in 2011, they approached the Institute of Medicine because of safety concerns. And that resulted in the HALP committee that evaluated the safety concerns of the devices that had passed through 510 clearance. And it ended with the chair expert testimony of Dr. Challoner, where he said, quote, unquote, this does not and cannot ensure patient safety. The 510K cannot ensure patient safety. So he suggested scrapping the 510K and instead putting some pre-regulations and formal follow-up studies post-clearance. Well, with all that happening and with everybody understanding that the 510K was a safety concern, Nothing happened. Inertia proceeded even after Dr. Chandler approached Congress. And so Dr. Chandler said the inertia that Congress has had in taking any action to move forward, even to study it more, this is a 510K, is unacceptable. So there was a lot of conferences going on and a lot of people involved, but nothing happened to make 510K safer or to scrap it. So there was another health committee in a few months later, and Dr. Sharon of the FDA assured the committee that they could not scrap the 510K, that that would be so highly disruptive to both them and the device manufacturers. And he promised to fix the problem. Well, 2011, now it's 2018, and Nothing. There was nothing that happened. In February 2014, there with the uh, CDRH, they had found that a lot of their managers were coercing and intimidating the FDA to clear unsafe medical devices. What they did was the managers forced the scientists to modify their reviews and put unsound evaluation methods and then accept that scientific data that obviously was not valid. So I mentioned that there was a grassroots activism in, of sarcoma patients. That began before the FDA hearing in December 2013, and it was headed by Dr. Amy Reed, who was the patient, now deceased, as of a, uh, almost a year ago, and Dr. Human Norchasm, who continues to be a, the relentless, fierce advocate that that he is. And it was through this grassroots activism and with, and I was helping all in the background, connecting everybody together and, and connecting them to meet in Washington, D.C., so that we could be best informed about how we were going to handle the FDA hearing. And during the hearing, even though we didn't get a band, what we did get was an immediate bulletin 
that was put out by the uh, FDA to discourage using the morselator in fibroid surgeries. And they had uh, mentioned that because one in 352 women are at risk of spreading this deadly sarcoma, they are discouraging use of the power morselator. So they allowed the GYNs to make the decision, but they were saying it's only in a very, very small group of women that you would be using the morselator. Now, another society of the OBGYN, the Laparoscopic Society, AAGL, shortly after that released a bulletin that allowed morselation with an informed consent telling the patient that it can spread cancer. So this was a little bit different. Instead of saying, we discourage it, we only want you to do it in a very small population of women, this is basically saying, if you set up the informed consent, you're fine to do laparoscopic surgery with morselation. So in conclusion, there's no doubt that the morselator is deadly dangerous during a fibroid surgery, hysterectomy, and the risk can be avoided by other options like vaginal hysterectomies and open mini laparotomy hysterectomy. So the incision doesn't have to be as large as a C-section. And there was recently an article that revealed data that showed that women are at risk from unexpected morselated cancers, even without having fibroids. And when they looked at this group of women that were at risk, it was much lower, one in 352. So what can we gather from this? Well, because of tumors masquerading as fibroids, we have women who are activists to try to not get morselation done during hysterectomies, especially when, when there's a fibroid. But you don't have to have a fibroid to be at risk if you're doing morselating surgery. So if you're doing minimally invasive laparoscopic morselation. I think the best thing with the morselator is to continue our activism to try and ban this tool that has caused so many deadly problems and destroyed families. And we need to band together, and I plan actually writing a letter to the FDA explaining what now we know, that you don't have to have fibroids to be at risk for a sarcoma. And also, anytime you morselate, you're spreading, you can be spreading any type of cancer. It can be cervical cancer. It can be endometrial cancer. It could be the deadly sarcoma, or it even can be an infection. So even though there are tests done for endometrial cancer and cervical cancer, they are not 100%. Morselation should not be used. Thank you so much for your time.